Awesome. Now, today I want to speak to you, I want to ask you the question, who do you think you are? That's the title of my message today. Who do you think you are? And it comes from John chapter 8, so if you want to look at John chapter 8, and we're going to look at verse 51 through 53, it is on the screen if you don't have it, and, um, and this is what it says, I tell you the truth. If anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. That was what Jesus said. At this, the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are (laughs) demon-possessed. That's a real wonderful statement about Jesus. Now we know that you're demon-possessed. And maybe there's somebody who's been, you know, somebody who just thinks you're just crazy. You go to that church? Oh, man, you must just, you're just crazy. And there are people who think that we're a cult. We're just nuts, but we're just nuts for the right thing. We're nuts about Jesus, amen? He says, at this the Jews exclaim, now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets, yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? That's, that, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost as though the devil was just using these people to just look in his, in his face and point his finger and say, who do you think you are? And I believe that every single one of us come to a point in our journey with the Lord, we're trying to follow God, where the enemy just brings something to us that just literally says, who do you think you are? It's like game on. And so I want to answer that question today. I want want us to talk about that, and I want to look at three things. I want to look at what does Satan think about you? What does God think about you? And what do you think about you? You need to be able to answer that question. What do you think about you? Who do you think you are? And And so we're going to talk about that today. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit in this place. I ask, Lord, that you will just bless your people today minister to them, let them sense the anointing of your Holy Spirit on them, Lord. We need to hear and receive all that you have for us today, God. And so we open our hearts, we open our minds to you for you to say whatever you want to say, God. If you want to mess us up today, God, we're okay with that. You just do what you want to do, God. And we ask, Lord, that your anointing might rest upon me. I just want to be your vessel and say what you want me to say today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before I go on, I do want to say that I have the most wonderful wife in the world. She just is, uh, she's, she's awesome. And uh, and she looks good in purple, so that's, <laughs> hallelujah. You heard, about the, you heard about the lady who just, you know, she had a spending addiction, and her husband says, no more, you can't keep spending on clothes. You just can't. And so he said, uh, what I want you to do is when you see something, uh, you know, that you just have this desire to buy, just say, get behind me, Satan. And she said, I did that. And he turned around and he said, well, it looks good from back here too. You should buy it. <laughs> All right. What does the devil think about you? He believes, you know, you are Satan's prime target. You're his prime target. And the reason that is, is not because he hates you so much. It's because he wants to get at God, and there's absolutely nothing he can do to God. He cannot harm God in any possible way. God is so much greater than he is. There is just absolutely nothing that he can do to upset God whatsoever, except to mess with you. When he messes with you, it hurts the heart of God. It breaks the heart of God when we, when we sin and we choose to follow a different direction than the direction that God told us to follow. And it breaks his heart and it makes Satan laugh. And so uh, when we look at what Satan thinks about you, these are some of the things that Satan thinks about you. He, the Bible tells us in John 10.10 10, his strategy. The thief comes not but for to what? Steal, to kill, and to destroy. 
He has done his best to rob from you. He wants to steal from you your joy. He wants to steal your faith. He wants to rob you of, of wonderful relationships that you have with one another. He wants to divide you. He wants to conquer you. He wants to just strip you of everything that uh, God has placed within you that you absolutely just crave and want and love. And he wants to bring to you a counterfeit for you to follow after. And he's, he's deceived us, so many people and he's gotten them them to believe that, you know, God is just a bunch of, church is just about a bunch of rules, it's just religion, I don't want any part of it, and he's got people who have, who have once had a relationship with Christ to walk away. He's come to steal, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. But I'm glad that scripture is not done yet, amen? Because it says after that, but I have come, Jesus says, to give you life and have it more abundantly, that you might have life have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Um, what, the devil, what does the devil think? He thinks that you are a prisoner. You are a prisoner. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21 says this. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. Sexual immorality, impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, participation in demonic activity, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, divisions, the feeling that everyone is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other kinds of sin. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living like that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Satan believes about you that you are trapped in that. He believes that you are a prisoner. He wants you to believe that you are a prisoner, that you'll never get out of it, that you'll never be set free from it. The, um, the devil thinks that you are hopeless. You're hopeless to escape the prison of sin. He believes that you will never be good enough. How many of you have ever heard that voice in your head? You'll never be good enough. It just, why, why do you even try? Why are you even striving after that? Because it will never work. You'll never be good enough. And the enemy uh, does a pretty good job of proclaiming that. And we see a lot of people who are in that situation, in that prison, in that, uh, that, that keeps them from really having that confidence to go forward. He thinks that you are destined for hell and you'll never get out. In Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, even the church recognizes the power that the enemy has. He has power. And, and the Bible is telling us, Paul is telling us in that passage of Scripture, please realize you do not struggle against flesh and blood. Now, how many of you have had a person in your life that you kind of struggled with? Oh, come on, you holy, righteous people. Be honest. Of course you have. And what, what God wants you to see is that the struggle is not, it's not really against flesh and blood. You see, if you could kind of pull back the veil, you know, somebody says, hi, what's your name? If you could pull back the veil, they'd say, oh, I, I'm anger uh, with some jealousy mixed in. Um, oh, yeah, what's your name? Oh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm bitterness. Uh, I'm depression. And we would, if we could really pull back the curtain, a lot of the things that we, who we are and what we think about ourselves could be revealed. And it would reveal that there's a lot of things that we think about ourselves. There's a lot of things that the enemy has tried to put into us and trying to, trying to cram down our throat to make us believe. And I'm really sick and tired of the devil cramming stuff down our throat. I'm really sick and tired of, of the minority of people in our nation cramming uh, homosexuality down our throat, that, that, that we're haters, that we are just haters. You know, I've, I've been involved in the church for a long, long time, and I don't see a whole bunch of haters. I see people who love righteousness, who love Jesus Christ, who love people. And in the process of loving people, you want them to thrive with God. But the enemy is stealing, he's killing, and he's destroying people because of, of the things that he has, he has put upon us. And we need to show this world that we're not haters, 
even though that message has been proclaimed over and over and over again, and I'm sick of it. But we need to recognize that, that we have a mission. We have a mission to proclaim in our world. And there is, it, there is, it is time for us to do that. So anyway, let me, I'm, I'm getting past my, uh, my point here. So I'll get to that here in just a minute. So he tells us that we, we have, there is um, there's authority, rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But in uh, verses 10 and 11, it says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And then he goes on to talk about the, uh, he talks about the, the armor that we have, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, our loins girded about with truth, our feet shall have the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, hallelujah. We have that as an armor that God has given to us, and he has given to us that so that we can be victorious. And God wants us to be victorious. In Luke chapter 10, verse 19, he says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. So who does God say that you are? We know what Satan says. We know that he is, he is determined that he's going to convince us that we are defeated, that we cannot overcome. But Jesus says that you are his representative. That you have authority it's interesting in that past description, I absolutely love this. He says, I have given you authority. I've given you authority. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth should be loosed in heaven. I give those to you. Hallelujah. These are my keys. I know what door, all of those open. Keys are about opening and closing doors. It's about getting access and closing access. And so it's really an awesome thing that God says, I'm going to give you the keys. And if you see, if you see the enemy's spirit running rampant in a situation, you see his spirit running rampant in that person that just frustrates you, in that person that you struggle with, he says, stop Stop warring against that person and start locking up the spirit that's running rampant in their life. Just take that key and bind that spirit. Bind that spirit. And then loose a spirit of love. Loose a spirit of joy. Take that key and open that, open that door to just say, Lord, I just want your love to just be outpoured. I want your love to just flow in and through them. I want your anointing to rest upon them. Just bless them. One of the things that we recently did that uh, caused me to kind of evaluate my time and uh, decide that you know, I shouldn't, uh, be presbyter anymore was we uh, decided we wanted to really get outside our four walls. We want to be very intentional about getting outside our four walls and getting into our community and starting to to uh, to minister to people that may never ever come to our doors. And so we, you know, we've done some things. We've done I don't know if you've ever done the gas buy down where you share one minute witness and and those, that's an awesome thing. It gives you an opportunity to share with people that are so happy because you just paid for uh, you know twenty five cents per gallon off of their gas. So they are so excited, and then you share a one-minute witness. We've done things like that. And so God really spoke to me about being a part of the Chamber of Commerce. And so like any good pastor, I took it to the board, and they said, we can't afford it. And so I said, uh, well, okay, I just, you know. And so I waited, and, uh, and, and, and then uh, later I finally felt so powerful about this. I went back to the board and I said, I really feel like we should be part of the Chamber of Commerce and, and look, we're going to do this. Either, you know, either we're going to you know, do it as a church thing or I'm just going to pay for it and, uh, you know, and do it because you know, it, was, it was kind of expensive. You know, it, was like, it was like almost $400 a year to get into the Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, expenses were tight. I don't know if you've had that experience, but man, expenses were tight. And, you know, it's just like, is this really something else we need to do? And so they didn't really see the vision for it, and I was just like, you know, I just feel like I'm supposed to do this. So at the same time God spoke to me about being involved in the Chamber of Commerce, it was I needed to start a business prayer network. Now we pray every, every Thursday uh, in St. Cloud. We meet, which is an awesome opportunity. We're able to meet at City Hall. We pray, we pray in, the, uh, 
in, in the uh, conference room right outside the mayor's office. And so every, every week we go in, we ask the mayor, we ask his secretary, you know, is there anything going on that really needs our prayers? And so we pray for our city. We pray for business, education, and government. And so uh, to start a prayer, business prayer network at the same time. So, we, so in November we join the chamber, and uh, every week they go through and they ask people, you know, who they are and, and what business they have, and they can do their little jingle. We've got one guy who uh, is from the Vacuum Cleaner Center, and he stands up and he says his name, and he says, he says, I'm from the Vacuum Cleaner Center. Our business sucks, but it's picking up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so they go through everybody at the chamber, you know, and so, and so uh, they come to me, and I, always, I stand up and I say, I'm Craig Moore, I'm pastor of Life Assembly of God Church and a part of Blessed St. Cloud. We're praying for our city. We pray every, every Thursday for our city and we pray for businesses. We pray that you will thrive. We pray that you will prosper. We pray that the economy will thrive and we pray that you'll be blessed in your home and your marriages. And uh, if you'd like to be a part of our business prayer network, give me a card and we'll pray for you specifically. And so then I send out an email to them saying, you know, giving them a little scripture, encouragement, and telling them, you have 53 people that are in our business prayer partners who are praying for you every single week. And, I, and, then, and then if you will, uh, you know, if you give me a card. Since November, I've gotten 125 people who said, yes, I want to be a part of your business prayer network. Aww. Hallelujah. Is that awesome? <laughs> and so... And so every week I send these people, a, a, you know, just a little encouraging word and they send me back prayer requests and I forward them on to our prayer partners and it's just been an awesome thing. And so out of that, I had the other day, I had a guy come and he's, you know, he's just talking to me and he said, you know, we're a hockey family and it's really hard for us to get to church and get involved in church. And so he said, but I really want to know more, I want to learn more about the Bible. And I said, well, you know, we could do a Bible study or something. Really? Would you do that? I said, well, sure, we'll do a Bible study. And so I said, why don't we uh, set a time when that works for you, and we'll just invite whoever wants to come. And I'll send out, you know, 125 emails to the other people who are part of our business prayer network. Do you, would you like to be a part, part of a Bible study? And uh, I have about 20 people now who are said, yes, I want to be a part of that Bible study. And about 13, uh, about 16 people have shown up. We have about 10 to, to, to 12 people that are there every Wednesday. And so... That's kind of the things that is, I mean, that is turning my crank. I am just so pumped to be able to do this and be able to minister to people. In fact, I had one guy who, um, who uh, asked us to come to one of his seminars. He does kind of positive thinkings for corporations and try to, try to change how, you, you know, how your employees think and you have a better atmosphere and all this kind of stuff. And So I went and he, I, he asked me afterwards how to, how he, what I thought, and I said, well, I said, a lot of the stuff that you talk about is very biblically based. And he says, I was writing scriptures down, you know, that really kind of fit with those points. And he says, really? He says, I would love for you to do that for me. And so I'm going through and trying to help him to, to add scriptures to it. And so this last Friday morning uh, at, the, at the chamber connection, I, uh, I come in and he and his wife are like right at the door. And they couldn't wait to talk to me. And so we've been waiting for you. And it's like, why? What? What's going on? He said, uh, I just, we just have realized that our business has started to take off since we began being part of the Business Prayer Network. He said we were, there were people we had talked to numerous times about doing something for, and they always said, no, no, we don't, we don't really have the, the uh, ability to do that right now. And all of a sudden now, he says, like, we got four of those people that have called us saying, we want to we do this for you. And he said, we've got people coming to, for, for business that we didn't even, you know, we never talked to. We don't even know for sure how they got a hold of us. And we know that that is because of prayer. And we're excited about that. Hallelujah. Can somebody say, praise the Lord. So I, so I said, well, that's awesome. He said, well, oh, that's not all. <laughs> he said, that's not all. We've decided that we're going to start tithing to your church. They've never been inside the doors of our church before. But I got the first check on Friday. I can't wait to go show the deacons. <laughs> I can't wait. 
And so, you know, it's just so much fun to just be outside your four walls, to be out there doing the things that God wants you to do. And I would like to see, in my congregation, I'd like to see that, that multiplied over and over and over. I'd like to see people in the Rotary Club, people in the JCs, people all over. And instead of, you know, saying, well, we're here representing our business, that they would represent God. That they would say, I'm here representing the business prayer network, and if you'd like to be a part of our business prayer network, you know, and, and, and see that multiply over and over and over. We're, we're adopting streets in our city, and uh, there's a website called uh, blessminnesota.org, blessmn.org, where you can go and uh, you can do this all over the state of Minnesota, no matter where you live, and you can adopt a street. So every day when you go to work, instead of, you know, just... Uh, you know, spacing out, you can pray over the homes that are on the, on the route to where you go to work. You can pray for all those businesses that are there. I've, some of you know St. Cloud, I've adopted Division Street. And so, you know, for the most, for the most part, people want to stay away from Division Street, you know? It's like I purposely drive down Division Street because I want to pray for these businesses and I'm praying that God will bless them and praying that God will open doors for us. And so I'm just very excited about that. And uh, it is, it's pretty awesome. So I just want to say God is awesome. So we are his representatives. Secondly, we are, uh, God sees us as an overcomer. In 2 Peter chapter 1, this is one of my favorite scriptures. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4 says this. His divine power, say his divine power. His divine power, his divine power has given us everything. Say everything. Everything. It's given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate. Say participate. I get to participate. Hallelujah. I don't get to just watch it from afar. Say, wow, I wish I could do that. No, I get to participate. In what? In the divine nature. Hallelujah. I get to participate in the divine nature. That's an awesome promise of God. And escape the corruption in the world caused by evil, evil desires. Guess what, devil? I'm not bound for prison. I'm not stuck in this rut. I have the ability to step out and participate in the divine nature. I can overcome the flesh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen? So who does God say that you are? Well, in John chapter 15, verse 14, he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what the business of his master. But he says, I call you friends. He says, because I want to share more with you. Now, there's levels of intimacy in our walk with the Lord. He starts by saying, I no longer call you servants. So there's that level of servant. He says, I call you friends. And then in Romans chapter 8, he says, he says, you are sons and daughters. You have the spirit of sonship, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It's a beautiful picture of just being able to crawl up in your daddy's lap. And uh, it's, it's just, he's, you're, you're my son. You have, you, you have the inheritance. Everything that I have is bestowed unto you. What a great promise that is. And you have authority. So there's sonship. And then we go beyond that. And in Revelation 19 and Revelation 21, he says, you are my bride. You are my bride. And intimacy, you know, I just feel like the reason he used that analogy is because it's absolutely the best relationship we understand here on this earth. is between a husband and a wife. That intimacy that they have as a husband and a wife that we have with one another, he says, he says, I want you to be my bride. I want you to understand an intimacy. I want to share with you what I'm not going to share with everyone else. And then he uses a lot of other illustrations, talks about a lot of other things. But today I want to talk to you about being a soldier. I want to talk to you about being a soldier. Because in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he talks about that we are his soldiers. He says, endure hardship as a good soldier. Now, this is the part that I struggled with when uh, I found out that, that Sandy had passed away and, and that the family was, was here. And I, I just explained to them, I said, I, uh, I said this, is, this is the warrior creed. And uh, the first service liked it so well, I got a whole bunch of people who says, can you print that off? i got to have that. And so uh, Pastor Dale is going to have those available after the service for you. You can take it home. 
But um, I just didn't want, to, I didn't want to be insensitive. And let me just say this. That maybe you're not ready to be a warrior because this, the warrior creed is, is pretty strong. You know, when people get saved, Jesus uh, uh, brings them into the fold. We, we call them babes. We call them babes. And, and, and we need to nurture them, and we need to rally around them, and we need to, to do whatever we can to help them to make it for Christ. And as you grow and as you mature, you should stop being babies, okay? Because it's really cute when your four-year-old, you know, uh, does something really cute at the table, but it's not so cute when you're 28, Okay? There is a time to grow up. Hebrews chapter 5, at the very end of that chapter, he, he, he says, by this time you ought to be teachers, but we got to go back to milk. He says, this should not be. And so, so some of you are ready to become warriors. Others may not be there yet. You may, you may still need a lot of nurturing and a lot of caring. And what I'm about to read to you in the warrior code, I was a little concerned about with the family. But I, I, I was, as I met with them afterwards, they were like, that was so perfect because Sandy was a warrior. She was a warrior. She was an awesome woman of God. She was a prayer person. She was a warrior. So that fit perfectly. So I was like, yes, God, you know what you're doing. <laughs> Whew, thank you. All right, so, hey, you know what? You, it's on here. Let's read it together. See if you can follow me and stay with me. And hopefully you'll agree with this. I am a soldier in the army of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Bible is my code of conduct. Faith, prayer, the Word, the blood, and the Spirit are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I am a volunteer in this army. I am enlisted for eternity. I will not get out, sell out, be talked out, or pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, and dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am a soldier, not a baby. I do not need to be pampered, petted, primed up, pumped up, picked up, or pepped up. I am a soldier. No one has to call me, remind me, write me, visit me, entice me, or lure me. I am a soldier, not a wimp. I am in place saluting my king, obeying his orders, praising his name, and building his kingdom. No one has to give me gifts, food, cards, candy, or a handout. I do not need to be cuddled, cradled, cared for, or catered to. I am a committed soldier in God's army. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. When Jesus called me into his army, I had nothing. If I end up with nothing, I still owe him everything. I will win. Hallelujah. I'm not done yet. My God will supply all my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I will triumph. I can do all things through Christ. Devils cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me. And hell cannot handle me. Hallelujah. I'm not done yet. I am a soldier. Even death cannot destroy me, for when my commander calls me from this battlefield, he will promote me to a kingdom where there will be no war. But until then, I will keep marching. I will keep claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. I am a soldier. Heaven is my final destination. Can you give God praise? Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord! Yes! Hallelujah! Praise God! Now, that sounds harsh to you, I'm sorry. But that's where we need to be striving to get to. You might right now, you might say, you know, I, I kind of like the food and the, and the pampering. I kind of like to be cuddled. I kind of want that stuff. What are you talking about? 
But there comes a point in time where you need to, you need to start serving the food instead of receiving the food. You need to start being a part of winning people for Christ and loving people rather than just sucking love from others. You need to get to that point where you're a warrior for God. And you may not be there yet, but you need to get there. You need to get there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It changed my life. It changed my life. Jesus changed my life. I owe him everything. I will not shrink back. I'm going to go forward. I want to be a soldier. I've, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Do you think you're a wimp? If you think you're a wimp, then maybe God is stirring you to say, i gotta, I got to cast that off, and i got to bring on the armor, and i got to be the soldier that God has called me to be. Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 23, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What do you think about yourself? Who are you? We know who the enemy is trying to convince you you are. He's trying to bring defeat to you. But you have a God who is above all gods. You have a God who is bigger than any devil that will ever come at you. You have a God who is bigger than your circumstances. You have a God who is bigger than your mountaintop. So trust him, trust him, and follow him, and see God begin to work in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, right now, we just pray that your spirit will just rest upon this congregation. Lord, I know that there are some hurting folks, God, over the loss of a warrior. A warrior has gone down in battle. But God, we know, we have hope and we have an assurance that she is not done yet. Her life is just beginning, for she signed up not for this life, but for eternity. And death cannot harm her, because she is with you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And God, I pray, Lord, that you will just rise up within us and you will speak to us. Help us to answer the question for ourselves, who do you think you are? Lord, when the enemy comes at us, we've got to have an answer. When the enemy points his finger at our face with the circumstances that we face and says, who do you think you are? Lord, help us to, to rise up and say, I'm a child of the king. I'm a warrior for God, and I'm going to take the sword and cut your head off. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just pray that you will help us. Speak to us in your precious name. How many here today would say with an uplifted hand, I'm not where I want to be. I know I'm not the warrior that God has called me to be. I see areas that I could show up and I have not shown up. I see areas where I could, I could do something that would be positive in this city, in this community, and I could make a difference in people's life, and I have not been there. And I, I confess to God, Lord, I am sorry, and I want to be the warrior you've called me to be. Would you lift your hand today? Hallelujah. Thank you all over this place today. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat right now. I'm going to ask you to come down to this altar right now. And I want you, as you step out in faith, I want you to step out realizing that there needs to be a change in your thinking. You need to stop your stinking thinking. And you need to realize who you are in Jesus Christ. And you need to be the warrior. You need to be the person who God will use and step out saying, yes, God, I'm going to be that person. I'm going to be that person. I'm going to be the one, Lord, that you've called, you've spoken to, and I'm going to take you with me everywhere I go. I'm not going to be a chameleon. I'm not going to just fit in with, no matter what is going on around me, but God, I'm going to be a believer, a follower of Christ everywhere I go. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, a spirit of transformation Come upon these that have come forward, that have taken a step of faith, that have said, yes, I'm ready to become a warrior. I'm, I don't want to be a baby anymore. I don't want to be a wimp anymore. I don't want to be ashamed of your gospel anymore. And so, Lord, I pray that spirit of transformation will just come right now. Just come across this place, Lord. Sweep across this room, Lord Jesus, right now. And let us receive that power. 
We receive your power. You have given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You've given us the authority, Lord, to trample on snakes and scorpions and defeat all of the power of the enemy. You've given us everything we need for life and godliness. You've given us everything so that we can participate in the divine nature. So, God, we receive it right now. We receive it right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to say that. I receive that warrior spirit right now. I receive that warrior spirit in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We just receive that today, Lord. We receive it in Jesus' name. Now lift your hands and begin to praise Him. Just begin to praise Him. Just begin to love Him right now. Lord, we love you. We worship you, Jesus. The most important part of the service is about to begin. And that's the part where you walk out these doors go to the places you're going to go this week. I want to pray for you in closing that God will give you two divine appointments this week. When you think about this congregation, you think about that this many people times two divine appointments, opportunities that you're going to look for, you're going to ask for. I want you to pray this every day. Lord, this morning as I go off out of my house and go off to work, Give me that divine appointment. Help me to see somebody that's hurting. Help me to help somebody. Help me to pray for somebody. And be quick to pray for them. Don't wait. Think in battle. Well, should I pray for them? Should I? Just do it. Pray for them. Be bold. And let God work through you as the Spirit leads you. Okay? That's the most important part. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I just speak over this congregation, Lord, your blessing upon their lives. I ask God that today, Lord, you will give each one of them two divine appointments this week, Lord, at least. Maybe they'll have one every single day, but at least give them two. May every single person that's here in this place today, right now, have at least two divine appointments. I pray that they will be sensitive to your spirit to hear that divine appointment, to experience that, and to step out in faith and to do what you're calling them to do. And Lord, we just give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, church really starts now. This is when church really starts. This is when the church goes to be the church. Amen. All right, God bless you.